Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, again, I'm actually well, one of the nephrologists at uh, your clinic, and they'd like to present um, kind of a summary of um, all the nice data that's out there. Uh, and then Dr. Nowak will share kind of uh, final recommendations and what we know so far and what's safe uh, to recommend it. So, so about cystic kidney disease, uh, we don't need to do a lot of introductions, but I thought it's important uh, to share that how um, complex the disease is. Uh, definitely there is the genetic factor, uh, so whether you had a de novo mutation or uh, most commonly inherited from one of your parents, uh, you inherited either PKD1 or PKD2 or other uh, genes as well. You, you have inherited other modifiers from uh, the same parent or the other parent, so this can affect the number of cysts and growth. Also, there's a lot of changes that happen uh, uh, through epigenetics, so things that happen after after we're born and things that happen to the cells. And these things definitely don't have much control over those. Uh, however, there's a lot of environmental factors that could affect making the disease better or worse. And those what I consider modifiable risk factors, so how much we drink fluids, uh, throughout our lives, uh, how much salt we take in our diet, how much uh, extra weight we have. Uh, so all these will focus a lot on those. But just to show you that all these affect all these different cell uh, processes that the cells and the PKD cells would uh, lead to a lot of cysts in the kidneys. And we'll focus on the metabolic dysfunction as well, uh, which is part of uh, the dietary interventions. I'm not gonna, I promise I'm not gonna go through all these uh, pathways, but again, to show how complex things happen inside the cell, and just this tiny change in the uh, PKD gene, that mutation that we inherited, how much uh, of an impact it leads and how much uh, downstream effects it leads. Uh, there's definitely a reprogramming of the metabolism of, of, the, of the cell, which means like how the cells um, kind of behave with the sugars, with uh, with the metabolism of the kidney, and definitely there's a lot of data now that the mitochondria inside the cell, in PKD cells, have a different structure and has a different function. Uh, so very interesting uh, concept within PKD that's now mainstream, and uh, that leads us to say, okay, what can we do to make these changes uh, through our diet and other things? So uh, to make it a little bit simple, so. Either we have PKD1, PKD2 mutation, again, those are the two most common. Those lead to many things that uh, are affected inside the cell, and we think there's higher, something uh, called cyclic AMP, and we can try to uh, lower that through drinking more fluids, uh, decreasing the salt intake, and then uh, blocking the vasopressin receptor, uh, or the thirst or water hormone receptor on the kidney, uh, because that cyclic AMP can lead to more kidney cysts. Now, the, most, the other important topic that we're focused on today is that term of metabolic reprogramming, where we think that the uh, kidney cells are um, not utilizing the sugars, the glucose, in a very effective way, leading to many things downstream that leads also to the, for the kidney cells to proliferate and then uh, form these cysts. And again, the mitochondria, which is the uh, energy uh, powerhouse of the, of the, of the cell, um, is not um, utilizing effectively these energy uh, sources. And so there's uh, all these different dietary interventions that could shortcut or uh, alleviate these problems. Uh, so we're gonna talk about all of those and I'll summarize them and, uh, and define them in a minute. Uh, but all of these can affect how the sugar is utilized in the cell, it affects the mitochondrial function, um, as well as the downstream uh, effect as well. And the hope is that by uh, improving those, you'll have less kidney cysts. So what do we know so far and, and um, how can we make that, translate that to practice? So since we're gonna talk a lot about the dietary interventions, I thought it's important to know what we're talking about in terms of definitions, right? So you will see or you will hear a lot about caloric restriction, which is basically every day, instead of eating the current amount, you would reduce that by 10, 20, 30, or 40%. So you would reduce the portion, so portion control. Now, intermittent fasting is something different, where you're restricting the calories, but about one to three days in a week, and they're not back-to-back, -back, so let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 
uh, you're cutting down your calories by 80%. So you're almost not eating that day. So you're definitely fasting. Okay. More commonly, most people would use time-restricted eating, where they would eat every day, but they would eat in a certain window. So let's say from noon till 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. And then the rest, you would just hydrate yourself and you don't eat. So that's time-restricted eating. And then there's the ketogenic diet, something that's been uh, in practice for different diseases, uh, starting from kids with seizures uh, many, many years ago. Um, so more than three, four decades that's been started. And it constitutes having a high fat, moderate protein, and very low carbohydrate. So mostly kind of reversing to uh, what typically we say 50% carbohydrate. Here it would be very low portion, and then you're uh, focusing on increasing your protein and your now there's some risks so to start with. What are the risks of these diet interventions? Definitely when we're restricting our calories, we need to make sure we're getting enough nutrition and hydration. Um, and then long-term, uh, we're always worried about long-term effect of these diet interventions. So with caloric restriction, uh, we wanna make sure there's no bone loss or anemia, there's, that's one concern. Uh, and then someone who's already with a normal body mass index, we don't want them to get more. In terms of intermittent fasting, the same thing. In addition, we worry about low sugars, uh, dizziness, weakness, and maybe being irritable during the fasting day. Uh, for time-restricted eating, same thing. We're worried about the adequate hydration and nutrition. Uh, same for ketogenic diet, but it has other side effects, such as high cholesterol, high uric acid, increased risk for kidney stone. And there's always this question mark of long-term sustainability. Can you sustain a ketogenic diet for a long time? Now, there's a big trend, big trend in all different diseases, metabolic uh, disease studies, obesity, everything, hypertension, kidney disease, outside of PKD, where we think food is really a medicine. Uh, definitely, it can reverse uh, processes, it can help improve diseases, but we don't want to uh, just kind of recommend based uh, out of the air, right? So we want the evidence, we want the same rigor, scientific rigor, um, that we would use for any other intervention that we recommend in our practice. So we base this off uh, retrospective data, so things that uh, has happened to our patients, but we look back, and then we make some connections. Uh, we base this off uh, things that we can make interventions in PKD animals uh, and PKD stu uh, preclinical studies. Then it's very important to go through the process of the clinical trials and clinical studies to prove that one intervention uh, has led to the uh, outcome that we'd like, because we want to balance the efficacy and the safety, and not just make any recommendation without without this evidence. So, what's the evidence on the preclinical study? There's a lot of very very nice data out there, starting from 2016, uh, uh, with this study where um, those are sections of the kidneys for uh, for mice. Uh, this is a those are the cysts. So, this is a PKD mouse. This is the cystic index. So, how much cyst we have as compared to the normal kidney parenchyma or tissue. Uh, now, this month, so each of the group has been uh, restricted in terms of their food by 10, 20, and 40 percent, and you can see a significant reduction in the cystic index, so much less PKD for the animals, the mice that were fed less. So if you restrict their food, their calories, we can uh, really slow down PKD in mice. Same thing in a different model. Um, 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 where 30% reduction uh, uh, also led to decreased uh, uh, kid polycystic kidneys. And same thing with a different model as well. So three different uh, models showing really very strong uh, data. How about intermittent fasting? There was one animal model that didn't show any benefit uh, for the animals and uh, the mice that went to intermittent fasting. Uh, there's two studies on the time-restricted feeding. One uh, here is positive, the other was negative. And this positive one is showing that uh, time-restricted feeding, as compared to normal feeding, showed uh, lower uh, uh, kidney cysts, as well as reduction or slowing down, reducing the cystic uh, process. How about ketogenic diet? Uh, same thing. So uh, with normal feeding here, you have uh, males, females with uh, PKD kidneys here. And then with ketogenic diet, there was uh, less kidney cysts uh, as compared to just one. Now, uh, we always say we'd like you to be very well hydrated. Um, that's based on a lot of rationale in terms of blocking that vasopressin receptor. 
so this study showed nicely in, in one model, uh, in one uh, PKD lab, uh, that with normal hydration you have these kidney cysts. However, when, when you uh, increase the hydration, whether through the food or through just oral fluid, excuse me, <coughs> they have much less kidney cysts. Now in this uh, PKD1 mouse model, there was no effect for, uh, for just hydration. There's also some uh, other uh, medical foods um, um, or uh, uh, interventions by giving beta-hydroxybutyrate. So BHB, it stands for beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a type of a ketone body. And it's produced in the liver during periods of low glucose availability, so low sugar. So when you're fasting or when you're on a low carbohydrate diet, uh, the liver uh, is producing these ketone bodies. So it's kind of uh, increasing that ketosis or ketones uh, through this uh, uh, additional hydroxybutyrate. And this is a very nice study, also showing that in, in this mouse model, uh, in this rat model, um, this is a PKB uh, kidney. And when uh, the, the HDB was added to the food, um, there was much less uh, PKD. So very promising. However, this is again, we're talking about preclinical Now it's very important to translate that to humans. So what we know in, in mice and rats might not work in humans and we need to prove. So what do we know in humans in terms of uh, diets and interventions? So we know that if we have excess weight uh, or high body mass index, uh, the kidneys, the PKD kidneys grow faster. So this is based on very nice data from Dr. Noah uh, um, that uh, put this together. So if someone with PKD has a normal weight, we expect that the kidneys on average grow by 5% every year. However, if someone has extra weight, whether overweight or obese, they definitely have much higher growth and, and uh, uh, the rate of growth is faster uh, in these patients. And, and this was shown in two studies. And then also the other side, if we lose weight, uh, whether through uh, diet, uh, daily caloric restriction or intermittent fasting. So if we lose weight, for example, in this very nice study, uh, for one year, uh, looked at, at these patients who went through two different interventions. And the main kind of uh, take home message is that the ones who lost weight, uh, their kidneys were not growing as fast. Uh, the ones that didn't lose weight or lost weight less than 5%, they continue to grow their kidneys as, as kind of predicted from the disease. But the ones who uh, had successful weight loss had much lower growth in their kidneys. So I think this is a very important message to share. How about with ketogenic diet? What do we know? Uh, there's been a lot of very nice, very nice studies from uh, Dr. Uh, Roman Mueller, uh, who showed in a pilot study here and called VSET PKD uh, in. 10 PKD patients, uh, five underwent three days of water fasting, and then another five, 14 days of ketogenic diet. And they showed that uh, short term, so very, very small study with a short period of time, uh, it showed the feasibility that the uh, ketogenic diet can induce the ketosis, and it's feasible as a short term. 90% uh, of the patients thought it's feasible uh, to do that. And then the liver volumes were, were a little bit smaller no change in the kidney volumes. Now, keto ADPKD was a longer uh, a trial for three months intervention and a, and a bigger trial. Uh, some patients underwent the ketogenic diet versus control versus water fasting. Uh, and, it, and they showed that it's feasible as well. Um, it's, a, it's a short uh, study for three months, so we don't expect a lot of changes yet on the kidney volumes. Uh, they did show nicely that the kidney function improved. However, again, it's a small number of patients in a short period of time. Uh, the body fat and the weight has gone down. There's some side effects with the ketogenic diet with the keto flu. Again, we talked about the high cholesterol, high uric acid, and it was effective in a way that in increased these beta hydroxybutyrate and the ketosis. But definitely, uh, as for Dr. Mueller always says, there's uh, it's a very nice study, but there's, it's not enough to recommend for his patients. So he does not recommend that to his patients today. And we need long-term trials to confirm the sustainable uh, benefits and safety. How about water? So we talked again about water. We showed that it's effective. So there's this nice study that came out of Australia. And this is a, an example of how we can do clinical trials for dietary interventions. So this is water. 
where so no one is interested in funding clinical trials for water beds. Very important question, and this was very nicely done by Australian, uh, the Australian group, Dr. Rangan, who showed that if you uh, have a group of patients who just drank normal fluids as, as, as they usually go on versus another group that they were recommending to increase their water intake, uh, 184 patients, so a very significant number of patients for three years. Uh, unfortunately, there was no improvement in the kidney volume or the kidney function uh, for the group that, um, comparing the group that took a lot of water versus the group that uh, took normal water. The main also take home message here it's very hard uh, for these patients, for our patients, to really uh, drink a lot of fluids and they need to be very systematic about it. So not everybody was able to reach that target, only half of it. And then uh, salt, it's important to restrict salt because there's a nice study also from Netherlands that showed the more salt in our diet, the faster the decline in the kidney function. Um, so every five grams, there's an extra half percent uh, a year uh, that you lose kidney function. So with that, I will, I'm gonna move uh, uh, the mic to Dr. Uh, Nowak, and uh, this is probably because we're in winter, so uh, this is a nice name I saw. Have you heard of the new diet trend? We wear winter gloves to make it harder to eat, and we call it intermittent fasting. So I'm going to go ahead and summarize the recommendations that we put forth in this recent review article as a group of authors based on the evidence that you just heard in the last presentation. And again, I really want to stress that there's no one prescription, so to speak, when it comes to diet in PKD. And certainly these are guidelines that we came up with, but all of this advice should be carefully considered in consultation with your physician and um, additionally with a registered dietitian. But these are the general recommendations that we put forth. And this really applies to adult patients. There is really not any evidence to put forth recommendations in a pediatric population right now. But starting with weight, based on what we know so far, it is reasonable to recommend that individuals to have a BMI that places them into the overweight or obese category, that weight loss can be recommended under medical guidance. And we know that there are benefits in weight loss outside of effects on PKD. Um, we need further studies that we're doing right now to really definitively know if weight loss indeed can slow kidney growth, but there's at least epidemiological and pilot evidence that there may be benefits. What does someone with a normal BMI do? We adv advise that patients try to keep their weight within that normal BMI range by keeping track of calories, not having excess calorie intake, essentially continuing to maintain a healthy lifestyle. In terms of hydration, our recommendation is to aim for hypotonic urine, which in practice may be more difficult um, to achieve based on the data that you just saw in terms of the trial that was done. But the recommendations are for patients within EGFR less than 30 for a goal of sodium intake of less than 2,300 milligrams per day plus adequate fluid intake. And then additionally in patients with an EGFR above 30 to aim for a morning urine osmolality that's less than 280. And finally, protein, our goals are listed here. The protein goal is um, a bit more restricted in patients who have kidney function below 30. And essentially it's avoiding excess high protein in the diet in patients with kidney function with an EGFR above 30. And then on here you see more general guidance based on the literature in terms of optimal dietary and lifestyle recommendations, which includes avoiding smoking, keeping a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, minimizing sweets, moderating caffeine intake, et cetera. Um, I will point out at the bottom, and the details are within the review article, there are various supplements and other aspects of the diet that we did not feel had adequate data, in, particularly in humans, to recommend as interventions. 
So to kind of put this all together, again, we recommend that any dietary changes are done under close medical supervision. And but our increasing or obese category could consider caloric restriction to promote gradual weight loss. And Dr. Shabib, apologize for that. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. All right, I can't see myself freeze. I just see my slides here. Apologies about that. Um, so these are our recommendations in terms of body mass index and long-term caloric restriction, particularly in individuals who are lean, maybe associated with bone loss or anemia. So um, it's important to be mindful of that. In terms of how do we know how to um, come up with a calorie goal? Um, in research, we use what's called indirect calorimetry to measure resting metabolic rate. There are estimating equations that can also be used. Um, this is one example of an equation. Um, and in our research, we typically are looking at about a 30% restriction in terms of um, amount of calories that would be needed to maintain current body weight. Um, if someone's already a normal BMI, the message is to maintain a healthy weight, to keep doing what you're doing, essentially. Um, in terms of macronutrient breakdown, the recommendation is to follow sort of a, a typical distribution, if you will, of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats to make sure that patients are drinking enough water in order to promote dilute urine. Sodium restriction is encouraged. In practice, this is challenging to do. There's a lot of hidden sodium in our diets. It's not just table salt, but processed foods, fast foods, even things like breads and cheeses add a lot of sodium to the diet. Um, for patients who have a preserved EGFR, um, rich diet in fruits and vegetables, high in potassium um, is recommended. And then our protein recommendations, again, are summarized here, which are dependent on a patient's EGFR. Um, currently, there's not enough data to support restriction of dietary oxalate or purine. And there's insufficient data in humans to recommend a ketogenic diet or beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, studies are ongoing. I think evidence is needed in order to put forth guidance in terms of um, the potential of these interventions to be beneficial. And we need to balance potential risks with potential efficacy in these studies. And then finally, there's currently No sufficient um, human data supporting the use of the various um, long list of supplements that we reviewed in this article that are listed here. And that is the end of my slides. I can stop sharing my screen here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I would want to say is that um, these um, recommendations, you know, what I wanted to talk about or present, you know, were pretty much summarized by both Dr. Shabib and Dr. Novak. And, um, you know, we have no evidence uh, to um, support, you know, recommendations for use of these supplements with clinical trials at this point. And, um, you know, the nutritional supplementation studies in ADPKD are limited, and they were primarily conducted on animal and cell-based models. And uh, without uh, clinical trial data, translation of these um, studies from animals to human ADPKD patients is challenging. And uh, therefore, you know, as Dr. Novak, you know, highlighted on her last slide, um, you know, at this point, we don't recommend the uh, consensus that we do not recommend uh, use of these supplements uh, without clinical evidence. Thank you very much. Um, the first question, uh, Dr. Dahl, for you. Um, how could the findings in this literature review be best translated into clinical practice for PKD uh, patients? 
uh, of course, in partnership with their um, care team physicians and dietitians. Uh, uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. I think, uh, you know, for all patients, when we, we're talking about appropriate dietary guidelines, we're first thinking about what their kidney function is because the dietary guidelines may be very different uh, for, uh, for people who uh, have a lower GFR or lower kidney function compared to those people who still have very normal GFR. And there may be things that we're more strict about, right? So someone who already has hypertension or chronic kidney disease, we're really going to focus a lot on salt uh, um, it, as part of our dietary recommendations. And as Kristen mentioned, it's really, really hard to get salt out of your diet. Um, for someone with a fairly well-preserved kidney function, what I recommend is a diet actually that, that uh, will sound very familiar to also to people with kidney stones, which is very good fluid intake, limiting salt, having good intake of fruits and vegetables, um, and avoiding uh, um, high sugar things. I think there's good data for that in PKD. And really trying to eat, uh, really trying to modify the diet from a, um, you know, sort of that typical Western diet to more of a heart healthy or cardiac diet or DASH type diet, dietary approaches to stopping hypertension is um, an, an eating strategy that's both good for weight maintenance or slow long-term weight loss, um, but is also a healthy diet in terms of PKD. And then for the people who want to do more than that, that's an individual conversation about do they want to try a, a, a product or do they want to try a plant-based ketogenic diet or do they want to try time-restricted eating as, as some other option on top of what they're doing already? Uh, I think Fuad mentioned this and I agree with him that uh, uh, time-restricted eating is probably the, the simplest of all of these things to adopt. The issue with it is, is we don't know for certain whether in that time-restricted pattern people are developing ketosis. So it's a little bit of a, of a challenge. Uh, but I think if there's really strong interest from the patient point of view of doing something or trying something, that has to be a, a partnership, right? We're never going to say, no, don't do that, or no, we think you shouldn't do that. But it's a conversation about what the risks and balances are, the risks and benefits. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nowak, for you, what aspects of PKD and diet would you like to see explored in future research? Thank you. Um, so I could start by telling you a little bit about some of our research that we have going on right now that I'm excited to see the results of. So Dr. Chabib presented some animal work that came from collaborator at CU, and then we also had this pilot study that we published in one paper that presented both results. And essentially based on that pilot that showed there may be a benefit of caloric restriction on kidney growth, we now have a larger trial going on that we would call st statistically powered to look at changes in total kidney volume. So in this study, we are looking at about 125 patients that are either placed into a intensive dietary education curriculum that's taught by a registered dietitian to restrict calories on a daily basis. Um, and it's about a 35% restriction. And then we have a control group that receives one-time dietary guidance and they continue to try to implement that without a structured um, type of component. So it mimics more typical um, standard of care. And we're looking to see over that two-year period, does weight loss through caloric restriction slow kidney growth? So the main outcome is change in total kidney volume. And one thing that's really interesting about the study that we have going on is we are looking at the potential role that adipose or fat tissue may have in the uh, mechanism behind kidney growth. So we're looking by MRI at changes in visceral fat. We think that may be particularly important, changes in the amount of visceral fat surrounding the kidneys. 
and we're collecting fat tissue samples through a small amount of a fat biopsy sample and we're hoping to learn more not just if there's a benefit but to better understand why there could potentially be a benefit and of course getting long-term safety data is really important too even if it's something that seems relatively benign like daily caloric restriction to gradually promote weight loss we don't know what the long-term safety profile is specifically in pkd and we want to carefully monitor that during the study um, so in terms of Future research, I sort of alluded to this, I think an important unanswered question in the field is, what are the mechanisms by which some of these dietary interventions may be beneficial? And we have some evidence from basic science, from mouse and rat studies, um, but I think we need more research related to mechanism and certainly continued research in humans, which is always more difficult to do mechanistically, but it is important to try to continue to better understand, is it actually weight loss and loss of adipose tissue? Is it metabolic reprogramming through fasting? Is it a combination of these two, which is likely the case? Um, I think further research um, on those questions is really important. Um, in addition to weight, I look forward to seeing the results of the larger ketogenic diet studies um, that have been proposed. I think we need longer term follow up in terms of safety and efficacy to really know if some of the data that we saw in pilot form and in um, preclinical models um, translate to human studies. And then I'll just close by saying I think um, Exercise is also really important when you talk about diet, that they go hand in hand. And we really don't have a lot of research on exercise in PKD and what specific recommendations we should put forth in terms of exercise. In our research, we do recommend that all of our patients find a type of exercise that fits individually for their lifestyle. So we don't prescribe a, a certain type of exercise, but basically increasing physical activity overall, particularly once patients lose weight to um, enter that weight loss maintenance phase and keep weight off. Um, maintaining a high level of physical activity is really important. Now, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, for Dr. Dahl and Dr. Shabi, as clinicians, what questions do you hear your patients asking about PKD and diet, and, and what do you tell them? What's your message to your patients? Do I go first? Go ahead. Well, so, um, I mean, we hear, this is a very, very important topic, and that's why we put this together, and that's why we're in this study. Right? So, this is something that as a diet, we have control over, as our patients have control over what they eat. And it's very promising and it's very, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great if we can modify our disease through what we eat. And I think it's going to be true, but we need, again, the, the evidence and the data to support that. And I say that because, um, you know, if the kidney function is normal, your diet is not restricted by your nephrologist. Then as your kidney function goes down, you're going to start hearing you need to be on a low phosphorus diet. Uh, initially, we're going to tell you low sodium diet, so low, later low phosphorus, low potassium. Uh, if you have high uric acid, you're going to potentially say low purine diet. So then when you, when our patients, I'm telling them all these restrictions, they're going to tell me, why do I need to keep going wrong? Because I can't eat anything in the right? So um, that's why it's important to make this differentiation that it's important to slow down the disease process and early on, because later on, you're going to have so many restrictions you don't want more restrictions added and you don't want to uh, add to your plate. Now that said, our patients are asking, um, they're, they're telling us, I don't want to wait a decade. I don't want to wait all these clinical trials to come in because it's my body. I saw my parents, my grandparents go through kidney failure. I, don't want, I, I want to do everything I can to do this. So our message is, Yes, it's very important that you modify your disease the best way you can. So it's important to really be very healthy. So if someone is still smoking and they're asking for dietary restriction, they're kind of in the wrong spot. They need to stop smoking and then go on and, and do other things, right? Um, we need to make sure that um, they're not overweight. And that's an important, very important health uh, uh, outcome for them now, for their kidney disease, for their PKD as well for later uh, for their heart health 
and transplantation. So I uh, definitely would like them to, to, to have as close to the normal body mass index of 25 as possible. And third thing is, it's important to have something that's sustainable for them. So it should be a lifestyle change um, um, and not just something that they can uh, work on for three months and then they bounce back to their other way, to their previous way, right? Which is a very common problem with weight loss for across the board, whether patients or normal individuals. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain weight. So it's important to have something that the whole household can, can maintain for, for months and years. Uh, right? um, so, and then we give them some recommendations on kind of um, how to go about with their grocery shopping. So kind of shop from the perimeter of the, of the grocery shop rather than from the middle. So try to avoid all these processed food and, and just try to, to learn how to cook from scratch, although it's easier said than done. So all these are kind of practical advices I give my patients. And I've seen a lot of success coming back, uh, them coming back and um, having really lower weights and, um, and, and they're happy about that. So those are the different messages and I pass with the content. And I think to, to add to that, I would say it's really important, as Dr. Chabib was saying, to really see where the patient is when they're asking that question. So a patient who's had recurrent kidney stones may have a different set of issues than a person who hasn't, for example, in terms of what's appropriate for diet and what's not. Um, and a person whose biggest uh, issue is weight loss and they've tried a bunch of different things and they still haven't lost weight, then we may start talking about medicines that are good for weight loss, right? There are some uh, for chronic kidney disease, not specifically for PKD, but for chronic kidney disease, we know some of these newer weight loss medicines are, are good for slowing down the progression of CKD. And so is that a conversation to be having? Uh, you know, I think really the point is we want to be sort of the, the guide so that um, the weight is well controlled before getting to transplant or dialysis and that people are as able to be as fit and as uh, strong as possible for those big um, interventions that are coming. I think Kristen's point of talking about exercise is so critically important, right? Uh, we're all supposed to, to be getting 20 or 30 minutes uh, most days of the week, and, and that's really hard to do, right? It's hard to fit in. And so it's a, it's a conversation about the entire lifestyle. I think that's important. And, and it's hard to change, right? It's hard to come to my office, hear me for, you know, 15 minutes uh, three, every three months and, and make a change. And so I think there has to be a lot of structure put in in how you uh, implement that change, right? What are those tools that you're going to use to try and implement that change? Whether that's working with a nutritionist or whether that's, um, you know, doing something like Weight Watchers or some other kind of caloric restriction. I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, other programs that, that help with this. Uh, I think the DASH uh, website, that's um, the NIH-funded website, is particularly good for coming up with meal plans and things like this. But, you know, it's, it's where you start and where you find the information that's comfortable, and then you start working from there. Okay, thank you to you both. Um, lots of questions coming through on ketogenic diet. Um, I think we've heard um, loud and clear the messages on the evidence that's available. Uh, but Dr. Mug, perhaps one for you. Is there any evidence of harm for patients going on a ketogenic diet? Ketogenic diet? Any negative impacts on those patients? Yeah. So from the um, studies that were done in Germany, you know, now we know that they're these are limited studies. These were a small number of patients, uh, but there was a strong enough signal to give us a warning that there is a risk for stone formation and uh, risk for high cholesterol in particular. You know, these two risks appear to be high. And, um, you know, again, it was very nicely summarized by Dr. Shabit, uh, you know, in his presentation about what is the evidence, you know, to support it from animal models. But, um, but in humans, you know, there appears to be unexpected consequences. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dahl, a question for you on um, dietary impact for patients with PKD and PLD. Mm -hmm. 
sorry, Matt, was that the question? What for what what's the best diet for PKD and PLD? Uh, yes, sorry. So when we consider these dietary recommendations, if a patient is looking at this and they also have PLD, what other considerations should they be discussing uh, with their care team? So I think PLD, um, you know, one thing that was true in that the first study, Dr. Chabib showed the, the small pilot study, sort of that phase one study with ketogenic uh, keto, ketosis, ketogenic diet is that liver volumes get smaller with ketogenic diets. And so I think that's actually an unexplored area for people who have liver cysts and uh, the liver cysts are, are complicated, whether uh, there's um, like uh, a, a role for ketogenic diet there. I don't think we have done enough of those studies to know the answer there. In general, what we tell folks with both liver cysts and kidney cysts is the, the same information. Sometimes the liver cyst uh, patients, if they're having problems having complete meals, we may tell them to have frequent small meals rather than uh, to try and have larger meals because they may have more issues with reflux or um, early satiety, feeling fuller uh, earlier because of liver cyst complications. But I, I think there's uh, really interesting work that could be done with uh, looking at ketogenic diets and liver cysts, but we, we don't have the data yet for that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nowak, a question for you um, around your feelings of the utility of home urine osmolality tests. I will defer to one of the clinicians on that one. No worries. Um, anybody want to pick that one up? I, I, uh, we just finished writing something on that, so I'm, I'm gonna answer that a little bit. The, the home urine osmolality is a good way of measuring whether vasopressin is turned on or not, right? So, vasopressin we think is this hormone that's important in driving cyst growth, kidney cyst growth, and PKD. And so, if you can turn it off, that's important. And so, the two ways we have of turning it off: one is drinking water. The problem with that is the effect is very, very short-lived. Uh, uh, you drink the water, vasopressin gets turned on, gets turned off, excuse me, and then you stop drinking water and the level goes uh, back up, right? And so it's very hard to, to manage that way. The, we use like a morning urine osmolarity as a sort of marker of whether or not you're getting enough fluid in. But probably the better test is a 24-hour urine osmolarity in that that gives you a better sense of vasopressin, of vasopressin suppression throughout the day. It's very hard to do that, right? Because we're telling you then to collect a 24-hour urine and then bring in a sample and let us measure the urine osmolarity. That's probably um, the, the better test, but uh, you know, we do, uh, particularly for people on Tolbaptin, we do use the morning urine osmolarity as a way of measuring appropriate dose. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Marg, a question for you um, on the different types of protein and their impact on the kidneys. The, the question being, you know, if you're eating chicken versus plant-based proteins versus beef or pork or things like that, what impact does that have on the patient's kidneys? Again, you know, as was discussed before, you know, we have <clears throat> limited amount of data uh, in the PKD field. Um, so I think that we can assume sort of general recommendations um, that are generally accepted. Um, but uh, with respect, you know, to, to answer that question about which type of protein, um, I think that it's interesting to see, you know, which types of proteins are related to uh, increasing uh, kidney function. And uh, we know that the proteins that are derived from animals, uh, they tend to increase uh, kidney function reflected as or calculated as glomerular filtration rate in a dose dependent fashion. Uh, and this was not observed with, um, with plant based proteins. Uh, so, uh, because of this relationship, you know, it appears that. Uh, the um, that accelerated kidney function, you know, with the higher consumption of the animal protein, 
you know, could have uh, detrimental effects and it acts against what we are trying to do with some medications like angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. So uh, in terms of which protein, you know, preference, it probably will be the plant-based protein. Um, at least, you know, this is what sort of in my assessment, it would be great, you know, to hear from Dr. Shabib Dal or Robert, you know, what is their opinion? Dr. Shabib, Dr. Dal? I agree, probably plant-based diet, uh, plant-based protein might be more preferable, at least plant-focused. So what I tell our patients is, you know, if you love the meat and you love the chicken and everything else, you don't have to completely cut off. But at least if most of the days you can try to be more plant-based. Uh, there's a lot of evidence on CKD, not perfectly CKD, but plant-based could be helpful for um, for uh, slowing down the CKD progression. Uh, so I think that's a, not a bad, that's a kind of an easy way to do it. And if, if you can go towards that goal, it's probably good. And it might help with the loss of tension. And I think I would just add to that, uh, um, you know, it, it's sometimes our dietitians will say, how about like meatless Monday, right? Like one day out of the week that you're not having meat as a way to, to kind of get to how to, how to live that plant-based kind of diet. Um, you know, we heard a, a talk today about how um, choosing more plant-based protein is a more sustainable option globally, not just for PKD, but for everybody. And so people are really, I think, looking at, at these questions in a, in a deeper way. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a, a good place to have emphasis and for us to learn about. Okay. Well, I want to thank our panelists very much for their time today. Uh, also, apologies if we weren't able to get to your questions. We try to consolidate the themes and topics as much as possible. Uh, for any further questions, of course, please follow up with your physicians or a registered dietitian. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for your time today and for your um, continued dedication to developing new evidence in this therapeutic area. Have a great evening, everyone, and thank you.